spiritual warfare from the side of the materialist looks like informational warfare. And I would say we're deeply mired in a fourth and fifth generation uh, global warfare type scenario right now. And I'm going to be following up uh, this video that I'm doing here with a kind of a deep dive and an analysis of the Oliver Stone documentary, Ukraine on Fire. It was um, banned or attempted to be banned from some social media platforms. I know YouTube has a, uh, a warning um, when you watch that video. And that video was done in 2015. And some parts of it are quite astonishing and revealing in terms of not just what's happening now in the war in Ukraine, but the, a lot of the events that led up to that. Um, so that will be my next video. Please be on lookout for that. But in this video, I'm going to introduce and read from um, Dugan's 1997, I believe, book called entitled Geopolitics. And you can read along with me here. I'm going to share my screen um, where he talks about in the end, the, the portion that I'm going to read is kind of the last chapter uh, entitled Ride the Tiger of Globalization, a Multipolar Network, where he talks about the strategic tactics that are being used and will be used. Again, I think he was writing this in the late 90s. Um, and in, in, uh, from his perspective, bringing about this multipolar uh, global situation, you know, away from this globalist unipolar um, world hegemony that we, we are currently under. And I think it's interesting to read some of the tactics here that you were putting forth or that was being put forth in the late 90s and, and try to reflect on if they're being used now. I'd say that, um, you know, is this propaganda? Yes, but propaganda is everywhere, right? And the question is, how do you discern the truth when there's nothing but propaganda coming from all sides? And I, I would say that the truth is something that is inside of you. Um, and it, it, there's a certain quality to information that if your heart is cultivated and, and you have a clean noose, uh, there's a certain quality that is recognizable when you hear the uh, when you hear truthful information. Um, so it's not it maybe not always the case, but I think that uh, there has to be a way of taking personal responsibility in terms of discerning truthful information. And in this year 2022, when we're deeply mired in informational and spiritual warfare, um, I'd say that spiritual warfare viewed from the materialist side is informational warfare. So I'm going to share my screen here. We'll get right into it here. Um, let me see, share screen. All right. So here is the introduction to the book Geopolitics. I'll link to this this, uh, this site in the description, and this is translated from Russian. Um, you know, um, you know, through the Google Translate here. So again, I can't confirm the veracity of these ideas or their origins. Uh, but I can share them and explore them and think through them with you guys because I think they're interesting and it gives a kind of a different perspective that you don't get elsewhere. And I think giving the reality of the situation, it's it's something that's important to do. So a uh, quick introduction here. Uh, the textbook Geopolitics is a new work of the founder of the Russian School of Geopolitics, summarizing the main trends, directions and schools of modern geopolitics. A detailed review of the theoretical and scientific origins of geopolitics is given the process of formation of various schools, Anglo-Saxon Eurasian coastal is considered, the influence of geopolitical theories and doctrines on political practices is traced, the connections of geopolitical methods with activities of such groups of influence as the Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, neoconservatives, neorealist, et cetera, are analyzed. The latest trends in geopolitics are being explored, neo-Atlanticism, cr critical geopolitics, space geopolitics, and the geopolitics of network processes. And we're going to be focusing on this section here in this video. Uh, so a geopolitical analysis of the phenomenon of unipolarity, globalism, and American hegemony is given. Um, and just to go through the table of context here, you'll see the first section is principles, foundations, and methods of geopolitical theory, uh, sociological approach, space as social phenomenon, um, Chapter two, geopolitics, definitions, principles, axioms, methods. Chapter three, survey of geopolitical schools, Atlanticism. Chapter four, survey of geopolitical schools, continentalism, Eurasianism. Chapter five, survey of geopolitical schools, geopolitics of the coastal zone. Uh, part two or section two is geopolitics of the global world. Um, and what the section that we're gonna be looking at is in the last section, book three, geopolitics of a multipolar world. And it's the last section here entitled 
uh, right here. Truth, turn the, turn, turn the poison of globalization into a cure. Ride the tiger of globalization, a multipolar network. Uh, some interesting parts. It's not that long. At the end, he talks about how to leverage chaos in this type of, of spiritual warfare. And he talks about chaos not as just this antithesis to order as kind of a fruitful chaos. Um, and I think some of the reflections and some of the writings here, uh, it will be apparent in terms of what's happening kind of right now. Um, but before we get into the reading here, I'm going to read this short fragment, uh, Dugan's examination number 71 on the threshold of demonic reality. It's, it's a real short here where he brings in uh, object-oriented ontology uh, and talks about uh, you know a very kind of interesting uh, metaphysical description of oil, uh, crude oil. So let's read this here real quick. This is from 2019. He says, philosopher Alexander Dugan, um, about what kind of future the world elites elite creates. What role do technocrats play in building a new world? And what role does object-oriented ontology, and that was, it's a philosophy, speculative realism that really came into the fold in the uh, 2000s, early 2000s, um, says philosopher Alexander Dugan about what kind of future the world elites creates, what role do technocrats play in building a new world, and what role does object-oriented ontology play? He introduces Reza Negrasante, who was one of these object-oriented philosophers, is an Iranian representative of speculative realism. That's the general school of OOO, object-oriented ontology. We are talking about post-humanism, post-human thinking, and philosophy. Geopolitics is not only a certain school, but also the ideological model on which American strategists build their foreign policy. Uh, two parties came together, nonconformist geopolitics, defending the interests of the land at the Nick land, and Atlanticist geopolitics, the same thing only through the eyes of, Atlant of the Atlanticist. Uh, both speculative realists and traditionalists describe the same reality. It is the same map of being. Brzezinski and I talk about the same thing in the same language, but we play different armies on a chessboard. Both sides agree that they are playing chess, not scuffle or hockey. And here's where it gets interesting. When you read Negrosante in his Cyclonopedia, you understand that it is about the same thing that the traditionalists were talking about, a description of the same reality. He describes how modern capitalism and technology is the destruction of humanity and the admission of demons into the world. The earth for Negrosante is a kind of object in the center of which is a demon. To awaken it, our civilization is engaged in oil production. The core, the flesh of a dead god, the plague gods, according to Negrosante, are trying to devour humanity. And now they are coming to the surface to devour humanity. He compares them to Lovecraft's idiot gods. It turns out, in fact, an inverted picture of the Aristotelian world. A hyper-delusional picture reminiscent of horror films, but extremely consonant with the vision of traditionalists, that the devil is completely metaphysical reality, the Antichrist will come, etc. Negrosante confirms that this is the case and at the level of speculative, speculative realists. Gradually, people will be replaced by post-human entities. Necrosis will become the only content of reality when the object lives due to the death of Dasein. Negrosanti describes a terrible example of one of the death penalties. When a living person was tied to a dead one and he began to slowly die while alive, the man could not understand whether he was dead or alive. Our humanity is exactly like this. Our subjectivity is tied to this corpse and dying is quote unquote progress. It's about philosophy. Negrosanti searches for words for this object, uh, object language. Artificial intelligence is not a technical, but a philosophical problem. The optimistic agenda of the humanists, the quote unquote, open society, et cetera, Negrosanti, uh, quote unquote, black enlightenment are being abolished. This is the new roadmap of the globalists. For the peoples, globalists are still talking about a certain increase in the standard of living, about migration, all of, all of this pink narrative of an early liberal society for the lower classes of mankind. The most realistic of them have already moved on to a new agenda. They are closer to active demonic nihilism. And this is the 
a quote to end it here. Where there are no gods, there will be no, there will be titans. Where there are no angels, there will be demons. There is no void. If we refuse God, the devil comes in. So yeah, um, and I, I'm still not sure what to make of Dugan. You know, I, was, I saw someone commented um, on one of my previous videos about Dugan about how they he feels from listening or reading Dugan uh, juxtaposed with reading like the Saints, Saint Sulphurney, and I couldn't agree more. It was a brilliant analysis. So Dugan looks is a brilliant, uh, in you know, spiritual and intellectual giant. But there's something about his uh, the way that he writes and the way kind of he intertwines the political Russian national um, um, interests with orthodox and, and other, you know, spiritual and apocalyptic type writings. Is there something about it that gives off a certain dark energy? Uh, yeah, I know the content is obviously dark because we're talking about the apocalypse, but there's another quality to the energy that is make, make gives one should give one, or at least gives me pause in, in kind of, uh, kind of co-signing and completely with his work here. All right, now to get to the uh, last section of this geopolitics book, uh, Ride the Tiger of Globalization, a Multipolar Network. I'm going to read from my paper here that I printed out, but I will share the screen as well so you guys can read along if you would like. Let's see, here we go. All right, so, uh, and this builds on a lot of the concepts that were uh, discussed before. So if you're interested to kind of take a deep dive, go ahead and do that, but let's go ahead and get started here. Um, this is building a multipolar world requires developing a special attitude towards all the main aspects of the globalization process. We have seen that although multipolarity is opposed to unipolarity and globalization, it is not just about rejecting all the transformations of modernity, but about giving these transformations a multipolar course, influencing them and directing them towards the image that is seen as desirable and best. Uh, desirable and best by who? I wonder there. And I have, I'm reading from my page here because I've underlined and I've made some notes in some of the sections here. It says, uh, and I underline this part here, therefore multipolarity in certain situations is designed not so much to counteract globalization frontally as to seize the initiative, start processes on a new trajectory and turn poison, quote, poison into medicine, close quote. Such a strategy repeats the logic of, quote, modernization without westernization only at a more generalized and systematized level. Underlined here, separate societies rooted in regional cultural borrow, borrow Western technologies in order to strengthen themselves and under certain conditions, repel Western pressure. Multipolarity offers, a, offers to comprehend such a strategy as a system that can serve as a common algorithm for a variety of societies. Let us give several examples of reinterpretation of certain aspects of globalism in a multipolar way. And he's going to start uh, this, this network, network spaces is going to be uh, pretty important throughout. Um, so he says, take the phenomenon of network and network space. In itself, this phenomenon is not neutral, but is the result of a series of successive transformations of the sociological understanding of space in the context of the, quote, civilization of the sea, uh, which he terms the Atlanticist civilizations, along the path of ever greater liquefaction of the information environment from water through air to the infosphere. In parallel, the network structure is that is the network structure that perceives the presence of connections between the elements of the system, not organically, but mechanically. A network can be built between separate individual elements that are initially not related to each other in any way and do not have a common collective identity. And finally, the phenomenon of the network contains the prospect of overcoming a person and reaching a post-human, if we focus on the very functioning of self-organizing systems, where the centrality of a person becomes more and more relative. But in classical geopolitics, here, let me move it here. But in classical geopolitics, we see that the confrontation between land and sea is connected not so much with being in one or another element, but with sociological, cultural, philosophical, and only then strategic conclusions that different societies make from contact with the sea. Carl Schmitt emphasized that despite the creation of a world empire based on navigation, Spanish society continued to maintain a purely land identity, which affected among other things, the social organization of the colonies and the difference 
in the fates of Latin America and Anglo-Saxon America. The presence of a developed seafaring does not necessarily make a state quote unquote maritime in the geopolitical sense of the term. Moreover, and this is an underlined section, the task of the civilization of the land and in particular heartland is to gain access to the seas, break through the blockade of coastal control by the thalassocracy and begin to compete with it in its own element. Now, the term thalassocracy uh, in Greek, thalassa means the ocean. So thalassocracy is this kind of hegemonic oceanic um, um, geopolitical situation. The same is true for network space. So he's juxtaposing the, you know, the maritime and this, um, this oceanic uh, navigation it becomes more liquefied, right? More rarefied and, and becomes this kind of network uh, digital space, right? The same is true for network space. The multipolar camp needs to master the structure of network processes. Their technologies learn the rules and patterns of behavior in the network in order to be able to realize their goals and objectives in this new element. The network space opens up new opportunities for small actors. After all, the sites of, giant, of a giant TNC of a planetary level, a great power, and a private individual with minimal programming skills do not differ from each other, and in a certain sense, they find themselves in similar conditions. The same is true for social networks and blogs. Let's see if I'm here. All right, so I underlined this section here. It says globalization is better that is betting that spraying codes on many network participants will somehow embed them in a context. The main parameters of which will be controlled by the owners of physical servers, domain name registrars, software providers, and monopolists. But in the anti-globalization theories of Negri and Hart, we see how left anarchists, theorists propose to turn this circumstance in their own interest preparing a quote-unquote revolt of the multitudes designed to over overthrow the control of the empire. Uh, and this brought up to me the, um, the color revolutions that we've seen in the last 20 years. I'm going to go into uh, more deeply about color revolutions and their configurations and constellations of tactics that are used, but I think this is kind of a precursor uh, of, this, of this type of thinking and, and uh, this type of warfare, actually. So something similar can be proposed in the multipolar perspective. Only, quote, we, uh, no, I underline this section, we are not talking about chaotic sabotage by sets of the standards established by globalists, but about building virtual network civilizations tied to a specific historical and geographical place and having a common cultural code. A virtual civilization can be considered as a projection into the network environment of civilization as such which implies the consolidation in it of precisely those lines of force and identification settings that are dominant in the corresponding cultural environment. This is already being used by various religious, ethnic, and political forces that are by no means globalist and even anti-globalist by coordinating their actions with the help of various internet tools, as well as spreading their views and, idea, and ideas. Um, this made me think of, of the TikTok a phenomenon in these type of social media applications. Um, it says another form is national domains and the development of network communications in lo local language systems. When working effectively in this environment, it can help strengthen the cultural identity of young people who naturally gravitate towards new technologies. That's the part that made me uh, kind of think of TikTok, right? You see these TikTok videos and the way that TikTok is uh, configured and the type of content that's on there is really a, a revolutionary and its effects are barely um, just beginning to, to be levied. Here he talks about how the um, Chinese internet, how it's uh, censored is a part of this tactics. He says the example of the Chinese internet where access to certain types of sites is legally and physically restricted, which according to the Chinese government experts can damage the security of Chinese society in the political, social, or moral sphere shows that in some cases, a positive effect on strengthening multipolarity is a purely restrictive measures. The network, well, we're not there yet. Then he says, uh, the global, oh, I'm sorry, make sure you guys, if you guys are following along here, we are right here. The global network can turn into a multipolar one, that is into a set of intersecting but independent quote unquote virtual continents. Thus, instead of a network, networks will, be, will appear, each of which will be a 
virtual expression of a specific qualitative space. I underline this section here. Networks will appear, each of which will be a virtual expression of a scientific qualitative space, or I'm sorry, a specific qualitative space. Together, these continents can be integrated into a common multipolar network, differentiated and moderated on the basis of a multipolar network paradigm. Uh, and this one I have underlined a few times, right? It says, after all, the content of what is on the web is nothing but a reflection of the structures of the human imagination. If these structures are understood in a multipolar way, i.e. as having meaning only in a specific qualitative historical space, then it is not difficult to imagine why the internet or its future analog could be, could be like in a multipolar world. And on a practical level, already in the present conditions, one can consider the network as a means of consolidating active social groups, individuals and societies under the auspices of promoting multipolarity, that is, as the gradual construction of a multipolar network. Um, this made me think of different groups like uh, BLM, Antifa, Anonymous even, uh, where you see a kind of uh, blurring of the lines between the, the digital and the real, where you have um, kind of groups that uh, are meet kind of in a decentralized me um, way online, and then that spills out into riots and protests on the street. All right, the next section here, we'll really get into this uh, spiritual warfare, informational warfare uh, through networks. Another phenomenon of this of the era of globalization is network wars. Methodologies of network wars in general, theoretical and applied aspects should be should also be adopted in the construction of a multipolar world. In this sense, the adopt, adaptation of network principles in the reorganization of the armed forces of the Russian Federation, Federation is a completely justified decision designed to strengthen the position of heartland and increase the combat capability of the army, which is one of the main elements in a multipolar configuration. The network-centric principle of warfare has technical and fundamental aspects, equipped individual units of the Russian army with network attributes, tracking devices, operational two-way communication, interactive technical means, is a self-evident side of the issue that does not require special geopolitical justifications. It is much more important to consider a different, more general aspect to network wars. We are right here now. The network war, as it is clear from the works of its theorists, is being waged I underline this a few times, is being waged constantly and in all directions against opponents, allies, and neutral forces. Let's look at this again. The network war, as it is clear from the works of its theorists, is being waged constantly and in all directions against opponents, allies, and neutral forces. So it's, it's like the confusion and the gaslighting is the point. It's not whether one side is true or the other. I mean, you can take on any topic here. But um, kind of the method is the means. Um, this confusion, and he talks about this in terms of chaos that is, is created through these kind of networked um, information sharing platforms, uh, whatever destroys from, their pers from his perspective the, the kind of hegemony, whether it's um, particularly good or bad for any side, uh, even the side that you know, he's putting forth here, the, the, the kind of confusion and gaslighting is the point I think he's, he's kind of getting at here. And we see that. Uh, right now, you know, with fake news and uh, the inability to find or trust um, informational resources and sources on the internet and on, you know, the mainstream media has really been amplified this uh, last couple of years with the coronavirus. So he says, back over here. Similarly, network operations must be deployed in all directions and from the center of centers or centers of building a multipolar world. If we take into account that, that the actor waging a network war is not separate state, but a flexible and multi-level structure that sets itself the goal of creating a multipolar world as a network war on the part of the Atlanticist and globalist aims to establish a unipolar world on behalf of the entire West. It becomes obvious that the conduct of this war by different poles, for example, Russia, China, Iran, will be able to create interferences and resonances that multiply the effectiveness of network strategies. And there it is kind of in a nutshell, right? When building a multipolar world, each pole is in interested not in strengthening the other pole, 
So Russia is not interested in strengthening China and vice versa, but in weakening the global hegemony of the hyperpower. Thus, the network war of the multipolar world can be a structure of spontaneous convergence of efforts and therefore be extremely effective. The strengthening of China is beneficial to Russia. Iran's security benefits India. Pakistan's independence from the United States will have a positive impact on the situation in Afghanistan and Central Asia, etc. By directing network information and image flows charged multipolarity in all directions, it is possible to make a network war extremely effective. Since ensuring the interests of one actor in a multipolar world order will automatically work for the interests of another. In this case, coordination should be only at the highest level, at the level of representatives of countries in a multipolar club. As a rule, these are heads of states where a common multipolar paradigm will be agreed upon, and the processes of network warfare will bring the overall strategy to life. And again, I'm not endorsing these views, but I, I think it's uh, I think it's important and interesting to understand the tactics that I think are being used, not just uh, by the East and the West here. Um, I think these are uh, kind of the, the techniques and the tools of informational spiritual warfare, at least some of them here that we are um, perceived to be happening all in our um, digital and kind of real life. So continuing here. The second important point of the theory of network centric wars is to emphasize the increased sensitivity to initial conditions. The point at which a probable conflict begins, what position the parties involved in, to, in it to take, and in what formation environments this occurs may be the decisive for the entire result. Therefore, the priority should be given to preparing the environment, local and global. And here's a section I underlined. Let's see if I can find it here. All right, if the alignment of forces, the miscalculation of the consequences of certain steps in the information sphere, as well as the advanced preparation of image supports are carried out correctly, then this can generally exclude a conflict situation and ensure that the potential adversary is convinced of the futility of resistance or armed escalation. This applies both, this applies to both traditional military operations and information wars where the struggle is for influence on public opinion. Therefore, countries proclaiming a focus on multipolarity can and should actively use the theories and practices of network-centric operations in their own interests. Theorists of network wars rightly consider them to be the key strategic tool for waging war in the conditions of, of the postmodern. Multipolarity accepts the challenge of postmodernity and starts the battle for postmodernity. Network centric operations represent one of the most important areas of this battle. And in this last section here, uh, we get into uh, the idea of leveraged chaos. So he says, uh, multipolarity and dialectics of chaos. Another example on which the strategy of turning quote unquote poison into medicine can be traced is the phenomenon of chaos. Chaos appears more and more often in modern geopolitical texts, as well as in the theories of globalization. Proponents of a rigid unipolar approach suggest manipulating chaos in the interest of the quote-unquote core, that is the United States. Anti-globalists and postmodernists welcome chaos in the literal sense as anarchy and disorder. Other authors try to see in chaotic, chaotic reality the germs of order, etc. The multipolar approach treats the problem of chaos in the following way. And I underlined this section as, as a um, fruitful chaos here. First, the mythological concept of chaos as a state opposed to order is a product of predominantly Greek European culture. This opposition was initially based on the exclusivity of order and later, as philosophy developed, when order became identified with rationality, chaos completely turned into a purely negative concept, a synonym for irrationality, darkness, and meaninglessness. But it is, but it is possible to approach this problem from the other side in a less exclusivist way, and then chaos will be revealed to us as an instance that does not oppose order, but precedes its sharpened logical expression. Chaos is not nonsense, but the matrix from which meaning is born. Chaos is not nonsense, but the matrix from which meaning is born. In Western European culture, chaos has the unambiguous quote unquote evil, but in other cultures, not at all. 
multipolarity refuses to consider Western European culture as universal, which means that chaos loses its unequivocal negative as well as the order correlated with it. It's positive. Multipolarity does not talk in terms of chaos and order, but in each time it requires clarification of what is chaos and what is order, and what is the meaning of both in terms in particular culture. We know roughly how chaos and order are understood in Western culture and how it is understood, for example, by Chinese philosophy and culture, but this is, and how it is understood, for example, by Chinese and philosophy and culture. After all, the concept of Tao, the way, which is key to Chinese philosophy, is described in many texts in terms that are surprisingly reminiscent of descriptions of chaos. Therefore, the multipolar approach states that the understanding of chaos and order must be tied to civilization, and it can, and it can be not only Western civilization at all. Secondly, by chaos, in the geopolitical sense, globalists often understand that which does not fit into their idea of ordered social, political, and economic structure, structures, and that opposes the establishment of global and universal and their opinion values. In this case, everything that is valuable for the construction of a multipolar world that insists on the other forms of identity and therefore carries the seeds of a multipolar order falls into the category of chaos. In this case, everything that is valuable for the construction of a multipolar world that insists on other forms of identity and therefore carries the seeds of a multipolar order falls into a category of chaos. In this case, chaos is a support for the construction of a multipolar world and its life-giving principle. And finally, chaos is, last little section here. And finally, chaos is as pure disorder or poorly organized spontaneous processes occurring in, a, in society can also be considered from the position of multipolarity. And if a chaotic situation arises naturally or artificially, conflict, unrest, clashes, you need to learn how to manage it. Right? Never let a crisis go to waste. Never let chaos go to waste. Uh, you need to learn how to manage it. That is, master the art of moderating chaos. Unlike ordered structures, the chaotic processes do not lend themselves to straightforward logic, but this does not mean that they do not have it at all. Chaos has logic but it is more complex and multifaceted than the algorithms of non-chaotic processes. At the same time, it lends itself to scientific research and is actively studied by modern physicists and mathematicians from the point of view of applied geopolitics and the construction of a multipolar world, it may well become one of the effective tools. All right, so that is the end of that. Um, I'll, I'll link again to see if you want to read it's it's a rather long kind of book that's published on there and again i don't know the, the veracity of of the writing or uh, maybe it wasn't even dugan that wrote that you know who knows right in this post truth world but we can explore the ideas together and um and and you know see if they map onto the reality that's uh that's in front of us or being put in front of us um so thanks for listening um tune in next time i'm going to have this kind of deep dive and this analysis into the film ukraine on fire um and i uh, appreciate you guys so god bless